Don't forget to put that back over there, and you're going to get in trouble. Is there a piano this morning? No. No, there's not. <laughs> there's just us. That's who's here this morning. That's all we need. That's all we need. Us and God. That's a deep thing. You should yeah, I don't have any church, but we all have a song. Capo on Russell's good. I think so. Because he is. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Let's worship God this morning. That means let's stand up. All right. Come on. Now, come on. Get with it. Get with it, people.
blessed day to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. We've got some bright and shiny faces. We've got some, some visiting faces. We've got some uh, not really visiting, but really back where they belong faces. And uh, we've got our regular faces and some that must be traveling this weekend. It's about to be a very, very busy week. So what does that mean for your church? What's going on in your church today? Well, let's see. Upstream small group will meet this evening at the uh, at Andrea and I's house at six o'clock. All right, six o'clock. It's going to be a bring your own. It's a taco. We're going to create a taco and nacho bar, and we'll be talking about how we as Christians are supposed to handle our anger. All right. Uh, Noah's Ark and the church office will be closed on Wednesday. All right, on Wednesday, and then Thanksgiving is on the 23rd. Hope you have your turkey ready. We will also not be having our Methodist Midweek Mission on Wednesday, all right? So if you show up for dinner and a Bible study, I'm sorry, okay? All right, I'm sorry. We will start that back up the following week at uh, on, on November 29th. And then uh, a reminder that uh, that that will also be our hanging of the greens. We'll do hanging of the greens that evening as well. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So put that on your calendar. Uh, the United Methodist Men's Breakfast will be at Sam's on December third. This upcoming, uh, not this upcoming Sunday, but the following Sunday. All right. Couple of announcements besides that. Uh, Harvest dinner was a great success. Was a great success. Uh, I know we talked about this last Sunday, but still, I, I want to acknowledge, um, we, we sold all the tickets, right? Correct. All the tickets. Plus some. Plus some. Um, and whoever, who here, yeah, you could stand if you participated or volunteered in Harvest Dinner this past week. You could stand up. Yay! Yay! Woo! Extremely urgent note by our very own Catherine Jackson. There is a church council meeting at 2 p.m. Church council at 2 p.m. this evening. Today. 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 All right. Um, let's see. What am I missing? Oh, there is a uh, there is a mission project that we have just completed. Russell, would you like to share a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah. The, the COPE project was a success. Uh, we took in a lot of coat. I did not get a count. I, Mike asked me for a count. I'm like, well, we didn't count them, but I said, Carl and I, we figured it had to be somewhere between 80 and 100 pounds because both the boxes that we had out there were full, and then plus there were some on the floor, and those boxes hold a lot. But uh, we kind of, we separated them and got them into sizes, and when the school's back a uh, week after next, well, we plan on getting those to the school. There are some that we're going to uh, get for adults and try to get them around town. Some of those that uh, we really couldn't hand out, you know, like they were monogrammed, they said Russell on them. So we took those to the fire station and uh, donated them up there because then the fire department uh, gets a donation from that clothing company. They come in and pick those up. I don't know if everybody knew that or not, but those blue boxes that are out in front of the fire station, if you donate, Clothes there, the fire department, uh, they come by, they weigh it, and then they get a portion of that, whatever, they pay them for the pound. That's good. Uh, good All right. but so, anyway, the, the coats are, are, are cut off. No more coats for this year. No more coats. No more coats. But let's let's hear it for that mission. Oh, oh wait. Uh, yes, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it for that mission, y'all. Oh. Yes, Miss
that time of the service where we are going to stand and we're going to greet one another, but we're also going to ask, how can I be praying for you this week? All right? Remember, we are not just a church that greets and smiles and says good morning. We're also a church that prays for each other and cares for each other. Amen? Amen. So let's stand up. Let's pass the peace of the prayer this morning. Morning, morning, morning. How are you?
it's children's sermon time. Come on up, come on up. Don't worry, you're not going to be by yourself. It's all good. We got some more. There we go. That's what I like to see right there. All right, let's move some stuff around, shall we? Okay. Much better. I want everybody to be able to see you this morning. All right. Oh, we got a strapper. We got a strapper, okay? Say, Chief. Thanks, Grandma, for bringing me up here. I appreciate that. All right. Good morning. Can you turn it down a little bit, Andy? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So how are we doing this morning? Good. Good? All right. A little bit more down. What did you say? Jesus made my life great. Jesus made your life great? Yes. Wow. Okay. We're starting off great this morning. All right. So. We got a big holiday coming up this week. What's the holiday? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Okay, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to cook a turkey? With God, with Jesus and God in mind. With Jesus and God in mind. Okay. Um, yes, that's a good face. Hey, 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 no help from the, the peanut gallery, okay? All right. What do you think is the what is the best way to cook a turkey? Come on, come on. What's the best way? In, in an oven? Oh, okay. All right, okay. All right. All right. When you say with Jesus and God in mind. Yeah, because one of the nice things we eat is cook a turkey. Cook a turkey, okay. Right. What do y'all think? What do y'all think? What? Smoky. Smoky? Okay. All right. That's good. That's good. Do you have one? Maybe grill it? See, why is it? Why, it haven't y'all cooked a turkey before? My mom has. No, no, have you cooked a turkey before? No. Have you cooked a turkey? No. You know how to cook, cook pancakes, but not a turkey. Okay. But, well, that's a, that's a great point. How do you know how to cook pancakes? Why do you know how to do that? Your mom taught you, right? Okay. So, you know, right? You know that a turkey can be cooked in an oven, right? But if you ask, if, if you had to do it yourself, would you need someone to help you? Yes. Why? Because yes. you've never done it before, yes. right? See, there's a difference between knowing something, like knowing what you have to do, and okay. really being wise enough to do it yourself, right? Mm. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about wisdom. God gives us wisdom by experience. All right, just because we know something doesn't mean you really know what to do with it. You can know that a turkey goes into an oven, but are you supposed to put a frozen turkey into an oven? No, we're supposed to thaw it first. Okay, well, see, but maybe you knew that. Maybe some of us here didn't know that. Hey, I do know this. You're supposed to fry it when it's frozen, right? No. No? But see, see, see where I'm going with this here, guys? You don't know until you do it yourself, right? And that's what God does. God gives us wisdom by walking us through things. Okay? So that's what I want you to remember. He's okay. He wants to sit there because he's okay. Hey, is that what we're going to pray? Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for the wisdom that you give us. Amen. Let's hear it for our volunteers this morning, folks. My friends, God has been good to us, amen? And our church has been blessed by Jesus Christ, amen? Let us now turn a portion of those blessings back to God. I want to remind you that our offering to this church is not an offering to an institution. It's an offering to the movement of the Holy Spirit. 
And this offering should be a reflection of our devotion and our faith in God. Amen? Would you please bow our heads and pray? Merciful God, we ask you now to open. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, and we ask that you receive the tithes and gifts that we are about to give. Use them to the furthering ministry within this community, and your will be done. Amen. any joys or concerns that would like to be lifted up to the congregation this morning. <coughs> Harvest dinner went well. Do we think that's a that's a joy worth noting this morning? Amen. Amen. Got our got a brother here this morning. Good to see you, man. Good to have you back. Good to have you back. I know you're just visiting for a little bit, but we're glad you're glad to have all of our, our visitors here this morning. Right? something from out there. Yes! Amen! There it is! There it is! Right? I was like, no one else is happy that it's Thanksgiving? That's a loaded question. So, okay. That's loaded. All right. Praise Jesus! She won't be cooking! Yes! Now, that, there's the real joy right there. There's the real joy right there. Okay. All right. All right, well, brothers and sisters, let's go to God in prayer. And friends, for this time of prayer, I'm just going to say a blessing over all of our Thanksgiving meals and our gatherings this upcoming week, okay? Merciful God, it is that time of year again where we have entered into a spirit of thanksgiving. Lord, we do give you thanks for all of the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, we ask that in all of our gatherings within this church, that you be present. That your Holy Spirit guide us to and from. That you bless the food that is going to be eaten. That you bless the hands that will prepare it. And may all who gather at the tables of our church feel love and joy as we give thanks for you, Almighty God. And we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians and chapters 1 and 12. We'll read chapter 12, verse 8 first to kind of set the theme, and then we'll read verses, chapter 1, verses 20 through 31. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. Now, earlier in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this. Where is the wise person? Where is the 
Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolish of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please bow your hands and pray? Merciful God, we ask you now to open our hearts and minds to the message and let my words be yours. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're going to talk about the spiritual gift or the gift of the Holy the gift from the Holy Spirit of wisdom. And what wisdom in accordance with what Paul is referring to. Because remember, the, the gifts of the Spirit is a concept that is given to us by the Apostle Paul. And it is primarily focused here in 1 Corinthians. So I think we first have to understand, when we see the word wisdom, what is Paul referring to? What is Paul talking about when he says wisdom? But I think we also have to establish what type of environment Paul is writing a letter to, to the church in Corinth. All right? There, there appears to be a lot going on in Corinth. And you'll notice, if you noticed in the letter, there was a lot of comparison, right? God chooses the weak, the weak of those to, to nullify the strong. He chooses the less to do the most. That's a common theme in this letter of Paul. And that's because Corinth was the epicenter of, of a lot of, of cultures coming together and different beliefs, different traditions, different experiences, all of whom were claiming to be wise and all of whom were claiming to be right. And Paul says something very, very concisely here. He says, for the foolish of God, and remember, he's talking about the God, he's talking about Jesus Christ. The foolish of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Before that, he goes to great lengths to explain how human wisdom is flawed, right? It says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And what is he talking about there? How has God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Well, and, and Paul kind of says mockingly, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Jesus took earthly wisdom and turned it upside down. Because earthly wisdom teaches us that dead men don't rise from the dead. Wisdom tells us crucifixion, and you'll see Paul mention numerous times crucifixion in this story. We preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Now why is Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and is foolishness to Gentiles? Because the Jews could not conceive that their Messiah would suffer such a humili humiliating death as crucifixion, to be punished like a common criminal. The Greeks saw crucifixion as this lowly, petty punishment, 
And here are these Christians claiming that their God was crucified. We know that Romans made fun of Christians in the beginning specifically because of the crucifixion. The idea that someone's God would suffer at the hands of the Romans and then be crucified was laughable to the Roman authorities. There's, there's actually, um, there's actually uh, paintings. You can go into a Roman see, and it's literally mocking. It shows a person being crucified, and the person's all twisted, and it says, here's such and such praying to their God. It's mocking Jesus on the cross. Christ crucified was a stumbling block because it didn't make sense. At least at that time. See, we have the luxury of knowing the semblance and the, and the importance of the cross. But here's the environment. We actually have a really good idea of what environment Paul was writing to in 1 Corinthians. So there's a, uh, there was a, a, a Roman who visited uh, the city of Corinth in AD 40. So about seven years after Jesus' crucifixion. His name was Dio Christenstum. All right? And you don't need to remember that name. Just know that this is his description of what Corinth was like. You ready? Crowds of wretched sophists. That's a religious sect. Around Poseidon's temple, shouting and reviling one another, and their disciples, as they were called, fighting with one another. Many writers reading aloud their stupid works. Many poets reciting their poems while others applauded them. Many jugglers showing their tricks. Many fortune tellers interpreting fortunes. Lawyers innumerable perverting judgment. And peddlers, not a few, peddling whatever they happen to have. In other words, chaos. How does one get wisdom with, from all of that chaos? And that's what Paul's trying to address in his letter to the Corinthians. He's trying to say, hey, you're surrounded by noise. You're surrounded by distraction. You need to remember who it is that brings wisdom. And who is it that brings wisdom? Jesus Christ crucified. The Messiah. The words of Christ, the message of Christ, brings the wisdom, the realization that we are saved from our sins. That's called wisdom. Now, Paul's definition of wisdom, he actually lays it out. He says... Becomes for us, it says, and this is in verse 30, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, that's, those two words, that is, are very important. It's the equivalent of someone explaining, let's say, uh, have you ever had someone, you know, bake something and you say, what's in it? And they say, oh, it's a chocolate pie. And then they go, well, it's a chocolate pie. It's got nuts. It's got chocolate. It's got meringue. They go through the ingredients. This is what Paul's doing essentially here. He's not just giving us a word. He's saying, let me tell you specifically what's within this term. He's going to define wisdom to us. He says, for us, wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Those are the three things that are essential to discern the wisdom of God. Righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So let's talk about those three terms. First, righteousness. Righteousness. All righteousness is is seeking to do the will of God. So we first must seek the word of God. Right? We first must seek the teachings of Jesus. We have to be constantly 
evaluating the messages that God has given us, the lessons that God has given us. We, we can't just be those Christians that hear something on the radio and then regurgitate it as if it's truth. We are a searching people. We are a people that are seeking for God to speak to us. And righteousness is that very thing. Seeking to know the will of God. Now, unfortunately, we, we don't do a very good job of that. We, we tend to seek righteousness only when it's convenient for us. Or when we have the time, right? When we have the time of day. God understands that. Well, I don't want to say he understands it. I think God knows we're human, so he puts up with it. But in truth, the whole seeking of righteousness is something that we have to remember, is that should be at the forefront of all that we do. Seeking to hear, seeking to do, seeking to feel and know the will of God in our lives. The second is holiness. Holiness. Now, what's the difference between holiness and righteousness? Now, in my opinion, righteousness is seeking to do the will of God. Holiness is that once we know the will of God, putting it into practice within our lives. John Wesley would call this piety. Taking what we have learned, taking what God has bestowed upon us as his plan for us, and putting it into practice in our lives. How many of us sit here on Sunday mornings, and we listen and we hear, and all we're thinking about is what we're going to do after this very time and service. How many of us read scripture and yet all we're doing is just going through the motions so that we can just say we read our Bible for an hour this morning? I tell you, there's nothing different between someone sitting in church who's not actually seeking to listen to what God is trying to say as someone who's sitting on the beach right now and not having any moment with God. There's no difference. What is the point of being a Christian if we're not going to put into practice what it is that God has given to us? Holiness or seeking to be holy is that very act the other word is sanctification that's used here. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. As Methodists, you should know that word, sanctification, because it is essential to the doctrine of our church. It means that the journey is not over after baptism. Every day, we get up and we choose to live as Christ-like as possible. And yet, how quickly do we abandon that resolve once we've walked out these doors? The final concept of wisdom is redemption. Knowing that we have been saved from our failures and our sins. Now why is that essential? How is a been a little tough the past two, right? Calling out some things. But it's also to remind us that it is never too late to redirect our lives because we have been saved by faith and faith alone. It is our belief in Christ that saves us. Which means whatever mistakes you've made, whatever path you may have taken, you can redirect it at any time. Here's the thing. It's, it's, it's like a schematic equation. It's like, or I'm sorry, a systematic equation. Think about it this way. Righteousness is listening to God. Listening and searching the word of God, right? Through prayer, through study, 
to silence. Okay, once we've determined, so we've read, we've read. Oh, here's John, John 3, 16. For God so loved his world, and he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, I have that word within me. I have that word within me. What do I do now? Holiness. Putting it into practice in your life. With whosoever believes in Christ, that, that means anybody can be a Christian. That means I can bring this message to anybody, share it with anyone, and, and they themselves can be saved. Right? Amen? Amen? That's an amazing concept, right? So we get to go out, we get to go out, and we get to go and do that message. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to be at the grocery store. We're not going to act very Christ-like to the cashier behind the counter, are we? God's going to call us to do some sort of mission, and we're going to say, oh, I'm too busy. And then we're going to realize it afterwards. Why? Because we are seeking righteousness, and we're putting it into practice in our life called holiness. And when we fail, which we most assuredly will, the thing that sets us right back on the right track is redemption. Wisdom is knowing this concept, knowing this system of faith, the system of righteousness and holiness, and then if failing, redemption, the grace that picks us up and puts us right back on the path and the direction we need to go. It's never too late. And that's the wonderful thing of the wisdom that God bestows upon us. It's the wonderful thing about the crucifixion. The crucifixion ensured that it would never be too late. As long as the gospel remains on this world, it will never be too late. Now there will come a day when, as the Bible tells us, that day of judgment will come and there, it will no longer, the gospel will no longer be taught or preached or lived on this earth. But I got news for you, friends. That's a long time coming because I still see a whole lot of gospel being preached around the world. Let me finish with this. There is a lot, a lot of information out there. And, and I'm not saying that some of it's not valid. There's a lot going on in our world that can trouble us. There's a lot going on in our world that can make us think that this whole Christian thing, we need to just hunker down in our churches and bar the doors and just brace because the end is near. That's not a wise thing to do. Because nowhere in Scripture does it say for the church to retreat within a hole and wait for the coming of Christ. It says, get out there and be the kingdom among my people. And my day of return will happen when it happens. But it's not for you to know or concern yourself with. Wisdom is a gift from God. And we all have the ability to achieve it. We just must know where to seek it. Amen? Amen. Would the Flinner sisters come up this morning? gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke it. And he 
gave a piece to each of his disciples, and he said, Take and eat from us, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks over it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant put out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. This table has been prepared for all those who come seeking Christ. You do not have to be a member of our congregation to partake. You must simply come seeking Jesus. And I promise you that you will find him here. Come as you feel called. ready for one more song. Alright. Well, with that eagerness, let's stand and sing Victory in Jesus. You ready? Ready. I went way over there, weren't you? Well, I mean, I mean, I just didn't <laughs> do by myself. There we go. Alright, here we go. Russell, ready? Yep. Here we go.